Campers, it's me, Ari Lehman, the first Jason Voorhees. From Friday the 13th, I'm here with AJ, and he's got the juiciest slice ready for you. It's dripping with blood. Jason never dies. What makes a horror film kill memorable, terrific, even in some way profound or poignant? Let's explore. Thanks for checking this out. If anything about it trips your fancy, please like, subscribe, and share. Oh, yes, yes. Without further ado. <laughs> Two nights in a row, a maniac greatly misapplied his maintenance skills when he put to gory use a variety of tools to see how many blood splatters it takes to ruin shade carpeting. During the second go-around, virginal high school girl Lori was taken by the killer for reasons outlined in two of my previous videos, so I won't get into it here. What's important is that the anomalous crimes have stymied the police, who are slow to believe Lori was abducted by the maniac, forcing her brother, fit to be tied Joey, a teenager himself, to undertake a personal investigation that leads him to the home garage of Vance Kingsley, the owner of the apartment complex, where he quickly uncovers what else? A toolbox. Clam shelling it open to get a look inside. It doesn't take long to find possible murder implements. Such a common tool it's easy to take for granted, it only takes one good swing with a hammer to perforate the skull and cause instant death. Feeling the heft of it in his hand, Joey seems to make up his mind. In a supremely precarious position, the doorknob getting a twist is enough to suggest impending doom. Instead of the rough-and-ready killer of several of his neighbors. Need some tools, Joey? Kent appears, Joey's casual friend and Vance's nephew. Looks, color, perceptions, the hollow effect and all that. And by any estimate, Kent's a desirable young man with all the magnetism and good looks it takes to set the world on fire. He did it. Your uncle killed all those women. And he's got my sister. She Surfing the adrenaline surge, making a massive discovery sends out like a typhoon wave, Joey's a little too outspoken and doesn't mince words. Come on, go on. Keep your voice down. I keep my voice down. The first sign of trouble arises when Kent's immediate reaction is to stifle and deny. Maybe seeing it as a matter of presenting proof. Come here, look at this stuff. See this? Joey makes a fairly compelling case. But of course, Kent remains skeptical. Yeah. Drill bit? Yeah, drill bit. And look a little closer. On a quest that would see him crawl through nails and broken glass if that was necessary to save his sister, Joey's too adamant to give any ground. This is blood. <sighs> is this what you've got, a rusty old drill bit? And refuses to let Kent brush him off. But look at this stuff. Here, take a look at this. Definitely not eager to openly accept the truth, Kent still gives the nail gun a good once over. Very well part of the act he's putting on. It's just rust. And there's a lot more. His examination leading him to point it this way and that. And look at the Ken, are you crazy? Don't point that thing at me. Oh hey, I'm sorry, Joey. Now listen. A nail in the brain when he wasn't looking would have been a hell of a lot more merciful than what's coming, but I digress. Unwilling to back down because he's advocating for Lori, Joey keeps pointing to the evidence, not yet understanding no amount of logic will win out. There's stains all over this stuff, and I'm telling you, it's blood. And they got tests they can do to prove it's human blood. Unwavering nail my feet to the floor conviction like Joey's is the stuff of myth and legend. Often because historically those who have it die or are killed in memorable ways. And if it matches someone's blood that's been killed. <laughs> Joey, you're crazy. And it must be the strain. 
This is 100% gaslighting because Kent happens to know beyond a doubt that Vance is holding Joey's sister. Look, suppose you walk around saying silly things like that. But has underlying demons besides surface reasons for being resistant to opening up and instead seems intent on manipulating Joey to change his mind by warping his perceptions, or is just preventing him from thinking to take off before things get more heated. Just suppose, for the hell of it, that that uh, dumbass Detective Jameson believes you. Whether looking for compliance and assurances, or waiting for a chance to hamstring and neutralize, Kent demonstrates how his looks and charisma have qualities that are comparable to Wolfsbane, enticing but deadly. He could, uh... Caused a lot of trouble for my uncle. It seems like earlier in this exchange, Kent determined that Joey wasn't going to yield, and other means would need to be employed to prevent him from blabbing. Joey? Very well thought of. Blindsided and caught off guard by a supposed friend. <laughs> Joey, suddenly doused in accelerant, finds himself in a dilly of a pickle. And by pickle, I mean the deep-fried State Fair variety. So you see, I gotta protect my family. That's not exactly true. Other decidedly depraved motives compel his actions. But laying blame at the feet of the cock and bull we tell ourselves to explain away having to carry out terrible actions will suffice for now. Uh, oh my eyes! A jarring turn, the sudden twisted flicker dancing in his eyes suggests a psychotic break, or perhaps underlying psychosis bursting up from deep within his cerebellum. Facing a crazy person. Joey quickly becomes the kerosene-soaked mouse to a pyro cat. Without the right training and mindset to combat such a situation, Joey is at Kent's mercy, at a loss as to how to fight back, having no way to demand respect or invoke fear to gain leverage. All Joey can do is plead and promise to keep his trap shut. But this has gone beyond reasoning. Kent is too far over the edge to draw back now. The instinct to survive, to defy the hand of cruel fate, is strong. But it's hard to determine if Joey is prolonging things in his bid to survive, or if Kent is just savoring his anguish. Eyes burning from the accelerant and all around discombobulated, the boy manages to lose his balance. Kent hovers over him, rubbing in his superior position like the worst kind of poor winner. Joey is in such a horrifying situation, it's hard not to have incredible sympathy for him. As Kent, seemingly overcome with bloodlust, psychologically torments the painfully vulnerable young man. Drawing out the suffering by rubbing in his helplessness. In a way that proves he was maybe a closet sadist all along. Before compounding the horror of everything this pitcher has to offer by tossing a lit match on our would-be hero and making him a Joan of Arc style martyr. Before watching with a sense of satisfaction and delight as Joey burns. A short distance away, Lori and Vance can hear Joey's screams, but it doesn't concern Madman Vance in the least. Are you afraid? 
Well, there's nothing to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. Those are children. They're playing. Exits can be extraordinary for funny, or should I say screwy reasons. As in this case, it hinges on putting the audience through a torturous event without the reward of catharsis. Something particularly harsh for what's meant to be popcorn entertainment. Although it does have the grimy veneer of Grindhouse, so ruthless harshness goes with the territory. Joey's demise is executed like an attack out of nowhere, bludgeoning the audience brutally, and excising all sense of hope for a positive outcome by shaking up and redefining the parameters of the whole ordeal. In a flick chock full of wild, vicious, graphic kills, this one emerges as perhaps the most extreme, shocking, and cruelest, and by extension the most vile and atrocious. A betrayal out of left field that leaves you feeling bruised and strafed. It's not sensationalized. It's not agonized over. It just happens. Like so many terrible things that occur like a strike of lightning out of a clear sky. Maybe because I view myself as the type to go out of my way to protect, and if necessary even rescue those for whom I care. Joey's kitchen sink odyssey has always particularly affected me, because it rubs in my face the tough but honest truth that no matter your best intentions, no matter how on the side of right you are, there are no guarantees of success. A young man unequipped to deal with the hellscape he found himself in, he was completely undeserving of the trial by fire into which he was thrust. This is another of those sadly realistic situations that demonstrates there's no definite reward for doing the right thing, for heroism, and fairness, no such thing. Yep, that stands up to scrutiny. Life is a callous mistress and the toll she takes can be in flesh. Sometimes ounces, sometimes pounds, and sometimes a whole body is required. To Joey's misfortune, she wanted him prepared brisket style, although anyone who makes brisket would decry the method utilized here. Joey was a kid who liked to stay out late and get up to youthful hijinks, but he wasn't a delinquent. Just a young man growing up and dealing with an absent father, a working single mom, and growing up in a bumpy period of time. But isn't that true of us all? Sure, he had a bit of an attitude, flouted authority, and by and large had some matriculating to do, but had a good head on his shoulders, a core of decency, and a solid heart. A risk taker, perhaps a thrill seeker, he was reckless and daring. The impetuousness of youth and the pursuit of justice driving him, causing him to blunder heedlessly into his undoing too trusting of the social contract for his own good, the rationalization that most people are basically law-abiding, if for no other reason than to avoid trouble. You better just kill me! Sidetracked by the quest to recover Lori, Joey was desperate to do the right thing, to foil a mass killer and get his virtuous sister to safety, not for lack of perseverance or tenacity, but for lack of prudence and instinct, he failed. He seemed like he would be proud to lay down his life on his sister's behalf, but the pointlessness of his sacrifice is crushing. Unfortunately, youthful enthusiasm, gall, and temerity aren't enough when you're dealing with an entitled rich kid egotist like Kent. But then, why would he suspect two members of the same family, albeit for different motives, could be psychopathic killers? Statistically speaking, that's a rare situation, especially when working completely independently of each other, even though they shared qualities like being disorganized and using a variety of murder methods. That it went so far as a live burning was outside the bounds of what one might expect on a sunny afternoon in the center of suburbia, too. Although not entirely out of the question, truly demented crimes happen in all settings, even the most seemingly prosaic and safe. I would just opine Joey couldn't be faulted for not considering Kent would go to such reprehensible lengths. The aforementioned social contract, the good faith the majority of us go forward with as we navigate this world, caused Joey to make the mistake of believing he and Kent shared a basic moral compass, and therefore at a basic level shared a sense of solidarity prohibiting such ghastly acts. Like one of those horrible acts against nature that are just seared into your brain like a hot brand. Such an extreme action falls outside many people's acceptable ethical boundaries, and maybe even outside their physical capability, since even when weighed against intense moral outrage, the smallest sliver of decency makes it a very difficult, if not an impossible, action to commit. Why? Simple. It's abominable. 
It's overkill, needlessly barbaric, and the height of cruelty. Even if it continues on in the modern day, it's a throwback in human behavior to much less civilized times. Pre the Age of Enlightenment, before humanity overall grew a conscience of greater consequence. Maybe because it's an easy method of killing since all that's required is a propellant and a spark of flame, is the sort of death that makes a deep and lasting impression, and is insanely and excruciatingly painful besides. Various methods of immolation are deeply entrenched in human history, existing in a bevy of forms, from self-immolation for sake of purification or extreme protest, to ritual sacrifice, from Indian widow burning to indigenous cannibalism, from a form of execution in the guise of Roman candles burning at the stake, and the most horrendous of all, the brazen bull, to mob vigilanteism or cartel retaliation, including the creative act of necklacing, which involves taking a rubber tire and some gas and, you know what, never mind. From the modern phenomenon of killers attempting to dispose of their still-breathing victims, to sadistic attacks on homeless in their encampments, Burning alive has been prevalent and popular since forever, a brutality mankind has inflicted upon itself since the power of fire was harnessed, and the onset of record keeping meant someone wrote it down when some poor soul went up like a match ed for their faith and beliefs. I suspect that the academic he was, director Wes Craven was well aware of the historical relevance of live burnings when he made that Freddy Krueger's motive to take revenge on the children of the vigilante mob who set him alight. Perhaps he was also aware of the story that inspired the film The Burning Bed, and knew that mankind's long history of burning each other predisposed the audience to accept it as a form of justice. We find the defendant not guilty by reason of temporary insanity. Farrah Fawcett is terrific in this film, and Paul Lamatt is a terrifying force of nature as her character's abusive husband, the, uh, one in the bed. The reason I broached the burning bed is that it's a good example of a single person burning someone else. I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of the horrors I outlined were group happenings, able to be chalked up to mob mentality, which often ramps up the frenzied state of all those involved. It takes either outright psychopathy, or being pushed very far, for a person on their own to set someone else on fire. So, with all that being said, what's Kent's culpability in his actions? Stop this insane witch hunt! An individual operating under the delusion they are committing whatever horror for a quote-unquote worthy cause can believe they are very decent and right. The mission-oriented types like Vance, for instance, the religious maniac who owns the house. Since Kent's surface excuses are just that, excuses, and his real motives involve twisted desires he will do anything, obviously, to see come to fruition, he's simply evil. The prospect of sexual relations, and the control that comes with that, is a pretty low and paltry threshold to drive someone to kill, but in a nutshell, that's most serial killers. Kent would self-servingly say that Joey's unwillingness to back down forced his hand, but he couldn't argue there was reason to end him so terribly, to end him at all. He had to know Vance's house of cards was one breeze away from falling over, but perhaps Kent saw an opportunity to white knight, and didn't want Joey wrecking his fantasy scenario. It shouldn't take a particularly deep friendship to prevent you from burning someone alive. Less angry and malicious than gleeful and maniacal, it seems a safe bet that Kent was always a representative of the Dark Triad personality. And maybe it just took an emboldening configuration of events, the right precipitators with the proper mechanics of justification, to let his freak out. No matter how subdued he became, how willing to bend to knee, no amount of groveling or begging would have saved Joey, because Kent's monster switch was hit, and once that happened, there was no going back. Unfortunately for Joey, even smart kids can be dunderheaded in their zeal to do the important, right, or heroic thing, and race heedlessly into their downfall, having not yet matured enough to employ a more measured approach, to understand every situation, above all those in which lives are on the line, are three-dimensional and have many facets that often make a headlong approach unwise. Joey's careless and spontaneous visit to that garage instigated a great example of someone getting smacked down to cold, hard reality. When we're young, we want to believe ourselves much more grown up than we are. 
I'm guilty of it myself. And only in hindsight am I able to grasp that life is like a structure we build. And as teenagers and young adults, most of us are only beginning to erect a framework upon what's hopefully a solid foundation. Joey fancied himself a big boy, and in so doing messed up royally. In an instant, a splash of flammable liquid reduced him to the little child we all try to slay when it's time to set aside childhood, but in some fashion or other always exists within all but the most jaded and tortured of us. The thing of it is, when presented with real violence, all the gallant make-believe and heroic pretending is reduced to the fluff and bluster of children chasing off ogres and dragons conjured in their own minds. Once Kent revealed he was a threat, whatever spit and vinegar Joey had dried up like the Sahara, and he folded like a lawn chair when he should have fought like a gladiator and voluntarily shoved in the Colosseum. If the lions are going to get you, you might as well not make it easy for them. I tell you this, had it been me, I might burn, but so would my attacker. If I wanted a joke, I'd follow you into the john and watch you take a leak. The moral arc of the universe might bend toward justice. Well, I'm sincerely glad to hear that, for all our sakes. But that's on the grander scale. At ground level, sometimes a mean child scorches us little ants for nothing more than a thrill. Hopefully, Ken forgot the sunscreen on his way to hell. Oh, Lord. If all goes to plan, this video will be uploaded on the second anniversary of my channel's first upload, which began with a deep dive into the toolbox murders. Last year, I intended to upload my redo of that initial video, but technical issues made that impossible. When I was finally able to do that video, I realized I had much more to say about this exit. It's always been a gut punch. Hopefully, with this video I've exercised the demons thoroughly enough, Joey's merciless murder won't haunt me anymore. I don't have time for these shenanigans. Well, I've about reached the end of the rope, so I won't leave you dangling. Thanks for humoring my ravings. Please share any refutations, opinions, accusations, japes, or other ideas in the comments below. And please join me for whatever I'm up to next time. Bye now. Bye, creepy man. Keep it creepy. He's a weird guy.